Hi guys. Hi Facebook. How how is everyone today? Um just checking in. Um I'm going to start by saying I'm really sorry that we've started at 2:30. We were meant to start at 2. Um we've started a bit late because we had technical difficulties, but we are happy to be able to have sorted that out. As you know, when you're doing anything technical, sometimes you get delays and everything else, but we're glad that We've been able to sort that out so for those who do not know me my name is harriet um i know on the screen it shows as rhoda harriet kataba so some people call me rhoda some people call me harriet both are my names and i'm the founder of her story matters organization um the page the group um the page that we're running this on um her story matters organization was founded in 2011 and the main purpose for her story matters is to share women's stories that's one of the things that we're doing today empower women financially and economically and also to support women um, to help them um, overcome the effects of societal injustice. Um, we're very passionate about what we do and this is one of the ways that we reach people. Um, so if you haven't liked our page yet or um, subscribe to our newsletters please do so on this page you'll be able to see the information on there um so um today we're also asking you to share this broadcast because it's very important it's very important that we support women it's so important for women to know that they're not alone it's so important for women to know that they have support um and it's so important for us to be able to join together and you know just support our sisters because you never know what anyone is going through and this is one of the things that we do through this page and through the work that we do that you'll be able to find on our website um we're calling on all of you all women to join us in in what our aims are in what our goals are which is to um female empowerment so this broadcast today is part of uh, one one voice campaign and one voice campaign is very necessary especially now because of the current pandemic more women are being affected with everything that's going on more women are losing jobs than men more women are getting raped and going through domestic violence and what we've seen as well is even long after this the reports are, are stating that women will be worse off than they were before um, it's really our responsibility as women to look after other women, you know, our sisters, our mothers, our friends, all of us, we, we have that duty for each other. So one of the things that we're doing is we're calling on women to send in their pictures or their videos um, saying why they support female empowerment and um, showing support for the One Voice campaign because different voices um, make up one strong voice, which is a voice of change that we want to see. And if you would love to be able to do this, please send your picture with the hashtag one voice campaign and hashtag history matters and female empowerment and a, story, and a small write up of why you support female empowerment and why do you think it's important. And we'll run it as part of our campaign. So we'll have it on our website. We'll have you featured on our newsletters and our social media. And I think it will be really fun to be able to tag everyone else as well and really have fun with this because we all have different reasons why we support female empowerment and I think all our voices actually do matter so you can send that picture or your video to stories at herstorymatters.com and we'll be able to um to use that on our social media so that's enough of myself and um her story matters I want to introduce the main reason why we're here um and I want to introduce Resna Resna is a phenomenal woman and she's an author and um I have known her for a short time now, but she's made such an impact in my life because I've been able to better understand um, abuse from a different perspective because every single person has a different perspective. So today we're going to talk about overcoming abuse and we're going to speak to Resna. She'll share her story. And the title, Why I Loved My Abuser, is because of her book. I don't know if you can see this book. Uh, yeah. This is her book and we'll put a link on how you can get access to the book. The book is free guys, right? So you can bless your sister, you can bless your friend, your mother, your aunt with this book. Um, it's a free book and it's got her story and it's got very 
amazing things in there. And, and Resna goes around empowering women. And I think it's something phenomenal. And we're really lucky to have her here today. So enough of myself and enough of everything else, because I, I can rumble on and on um, <laughs> on Resna to kind of like just introduce herself and tell us a bit about herself. So, hi guys. So my name is Resna Katoon and I'm the author of the book Why I Love My Abuser, like Harriet said. And um, the reason I wrote this book is because I wanted to explain and share my life story about domestic abuse. Because a lot of people, when you say domestic violence, they just think it's beating. So I wanted to explain the different abuse that comes with domestic violence. So we've got em emotional abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, digital abuse, we've got gaslighting, we have spiritual abuse, all these things coming together under domestic violence. There are different levels. So you have, you could have like just a basic, like somebody's just mentally, emotionally abusing you just to control you. And then you have extreme, where they isolate you from society, from friends and family, take control of you. So I had the extreme. Um, so I wanted to explain, because when I came out of my relationship, which was 25 years, lots of people, even friends and family, because I hid it so well, they kept saying, how can this happen? How, how come we didn't see? I mean, were you stupid? How would you? Why would you stay with somebody like this for so many years? How did you even have two kids? Did you have sex with this man? This is unbelievable. So I wanted to explain how I ended up staying with him, how the manipulation works how they, your abuser controls you, how they put fear in you to take control of you, your spirit, your character, your beliefs, and how I got into that trap. And then when I had the wake-up call, it, how it took me to come out of that situation, which was one of the, although I've had two kids, that was the most painful, uh, most scariest, most fearful moment was when I, decided I'm going to leave him. Even though I decided I'm going to leave him, it took me further five years to find the strength, the courage, to gain knowledge because I was completely lost. So I had to learn so many things in order to understand a controlling person, in order to understand domestic violence, because for me it was normal. I thought this is how everybody's marriage was, but it wasn't. So, and it was a, a, a table of ladies in a karate club that I met who empowered me. And this is the reason I believe when us women get together and we are positive for each other and we encourage each other, we can achieve amazing things because these three ladies changed my life forever. And that's when my journey began. And if even five years ago, it's only been three and a half years that I left him and so much has happened. But if five years ago somebody told me you are going to leave your abuser and you are going to be doing this work and you are going to be talking about your abuse, I honestly would have asked them what type of drugs they're taking because I couldn't believe that. I could not see that. That was like, I couldn't even dream of that. That was beyond my achievement in my life. So this is the reason I wrote this book because it's also, uh, an abuser can read it and understand the effect it has on us as a victim. And sometimes they can read it and they might think, you know what, there's something I'm doing wrong, I need help as well. So I went, I went in depth, but the, the section that I did hold back, a lot of people ask me now, why did I hold back, is the sexual abuse. Because it was so degrading, so humiliating. When I wrote the book, I wasn't ready to expose that much of myself, although I did expose a lot. And I do talk about sexual abuse, but I don't go into details. But since I've talked about it, written the book, I've done a healing process myself. And now when I do talks, I openly talk about the sexual abuse as well. So if you know anybody who needs to read, anybody who needs to understand, you know a friend who's going through because you can see the signs in people, just give them a book and hopefully they might make a connection and feel that there is other people going through the same thing and maybe they can find the strength and the courage to have that wake up call that I had with these three amazing ladies in my life. Back to you. Thank husband. you so much for, um, for for like sharing um, why you 
wrote the book, um, one of the questions that I would like to ask is um, to be able to understand more about domestic violence and, and yeah. particularly story. I want us to tell us about your community and like how your community treats women. Yeah. Okay. So in our community, it was really, really bad before. I'm going to be honest, about 20 years ago, it was very, very strict. Um, we did suppress women a lot. It's not a religion thing. I don't think it's hybrid culture. I think it's just the way it, everything always happened. Um, so, but it's been about 20 years, major changes happened. And um, our community now, names and shames people who have who behave in this behavior they don't accept domestic abuse now it's like oh my god this guy's abusing his wife they make it a big deal but about 20 years ago it was unlike that it was all hidden everything was secret you never talk about nothing you bring shame to the family it's like people are gonna talk about you you couldn't even mention you want to divorce it's like it's against you could never say i want to divorce you can't even you know you can't say you want to divorce but 20 years ago, I think because of knowledge, people all getting educated, people going to universities, college, people talking to each other, communicating. In, in Especially in Tahamlas, I went to a couple of talks um, before lockdown. And a group of women are doing amazing, amazing work to change domestic violence, that we don't accept it. It shouldn't happen. And it affects our children. And this is the important thing. Us women, we have a massive job. Not only that, we have to bring up our children, we have to balance everything. We also have to understand what we're teaching them. And if we put up with it, and my daughter was a, another wake up call because I thought if I put up with this and she's watching this, she's gonna think it's normal. Just like I thought it was normal because I saw it with my mum. So I wanted to break that cycle because I don't want my child to get hurt and I don't want my son to think this is normal and he's going to treat women like that. Because at the end of the day, I had a responsibility as a mother to make a gentleman and to make a good lady to go out in the world. And I didn't want the same cycle to happen to them. So it, it was very, very hard. But the cycle in my community is getting broken. There is lots of good work getting done and it, we don't accept it anymore. And we talk about it openly now, and there's lots of people doing amazing work because, because of the culture fear that we can't divorce and we have to stay and we get suppressed. Now we're not having that. We are openly talking about this and a lot of projects are happening. So the cycle is getting broken. The fear is getting broken because the abuser has uh, the most powerful weapon over us victim, and that's fear. And that fear they, they control with religion, with culture, with um, abuse, mentally, emotionally, gaslighting you. And a lot of things that happen in my community, they abuse you by spiritually, by saying, oh, this, you can't do, this is not me. I, this is, I don't behave like this. The spirits are taking me. You know, I have a black magic problem or something. They, they take it away from them. But it's actually them. And most of the time they have a mental health issue and they don't want to acknowledge that. So, but things are getting done. Hopefully, 10 years time, it will change even more. Even the change we have now in my community and my culture is a massive change. Even to say that we're not going to accept domestic violence, uh, women are not going to put up with this rubbish anymore. That is a big thing. So fingers crossed, pray to God, it's happening. Change is happening. I think it's it's very important for us to be able to look at communities, how number one, how communities handle this. Because I know within the African community, it's somewhat acceptable. I have spoken to people mm. or I've been in settings where they're talking about domestic abuse and domestic violence. And um, the advice that I had people being given was the wrong advice in, in, in my ears because it's a proven fact that so many women die in domestic yeah. violence. Um, yeah. So the, the same woman that you're sending back to that situation is the woman who might not be alive tomorrow. 
So in our, within our communities, we need to start having healthy dialogues and yeah. to start addressing this issue differently. Um, and I love the way you pointed out that they look at you and they say this is, is you know, it's like a demonic issue or it's black magic. And, and the funny thing is we come from yeah. totally different communities. You come from the Asian community and I come from the African community. And it's so weird that people think yeah. the same because in the African community, people would look at the abuser and they would not give responsibility to the abuser. They would tell the abuse, they would excuse the behavior by saying, you know, it's witchcraft or um, it's the woman's fault yeah. or it's something to do with evil spirits. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it's got nothing to do with that. No. It's got to do with an individual who needs to deal and address their issues, their frustration, before they even get in a relationship because if you get into a relationship or a marriage and you have all of those issues you don't love yourself you 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 look the person who's next to you is is kind of like your mirror so you'll be treating them the way you feel about yourself mm -hmm. yeah i think these are very important things that we need to start addressing within the community because um female empowerment is one thing but we need to have conversations with the men yeah. we need to have conversations with the elders in areas where they have elders we need to have conversations within with our parents because our parents have got very different views from us mm -hmm. our parents <laughs> some of our parents stayed in abusive relationships for years yeah. and they would they would want to continue with that culture but it's unacceptable Right. Because so many yeah. things have changed and we know so many different things and we know so many, you know, the scientific studies on behavior and all of that. So I think we need to empower our communities. And, and I want to thank you to uh, uh, for speaking about your community, because I know um, it's one of the other very challenging communities with regards yeah. to how closed it is and how yeah. information is is passed around. So um what one of the things i want to ask you is what did you see um or what was imprinted in your mind about women in society when you were growing up so when i was growing up for what i saw was women honest to god is to stay in the house cook for the husband and basically to obey your husband um even when i was brought up as a child my mom even taught me the same thing she said always listen to your husband you always have to look after your husband um, and then you have to cook for him clean for him you have to make him happy husband is everything you don't need to work the husband will provide for you he will look after you you are basically in the house and then I, then when I used to go to school and then the school would say oh what options you want to take what career you want to take and I'm like but my mom just told me that I'm not allowed to have a career. I have to stay at home and I have to look after the husband and whoever they're going to choose for me, I'm going to marry him and that's it. So, but the school was telling me, when the school would say, um, when you grow up, what do you want to be? I'm like, I'm going to be in the house. And they were like, no, you can't be in the house. You need a career. So there wasn't many women either role models because we were brought up very yeah. confined. Uh, we weren't allowed to go to anybody's house. Um, we didn't communicate with uh, our friends and families. We were very, very isolated in our house. All we had was each of us, brothers and sisters. We weren't even allowed to watch TV because my dad thought TV was a bad influence. So we would actually watch our TV in secret, maybe for an hour or so, and somebody would stand by the door. So when we see him coming, we would just switch the TV off and pretend we like reading or something. So there were no yeah. there were no role models around, um, but I did have a, an amazing, amazing teacher when I was nine years old, eight years old. And even now, she's still my friend. And we made a connection because she went through a lot of stuff in her life. And I was going through a lot of mm -hmm. things in my life as a child. And she saw something in me. And she came to me one day and I was getting bullied in school a lot because that time you were either black, white or Asian. And I didn't fit in any of them because I looked quite oriental. So I used to get bullied a lot by the Asian girls. So yes. I was alone now. I was always by myself. Um, 
she saw something in me and she came to me one day and she said to me, Resna, don't listen to the girls. You be who you are because your destiny is with you. You don't need to follow them. You do your work and everything's going to be fine. And from that day on, something happened to me. I've always had women who given me wake up calls. From that day, something happened to me. They used to bully me. I used to walk away. They used to say to me, why do you look like, you look like that woman from that thingy. And I used to say, you need to ask God that. I don't know why I look like that. Something happened when I started standing up to them. They got fed up. They stopped bullying me. Yeah. And I just carried on. But it was only that teacher who was my role. She was an English lady. And till today, she's still my friend. And I still meet her and we have coffees together. So um, what I really like about your story as well is that you're showing us a, another dimension, which is yeah. the role that teachers play in, in students' lives. Because um, much that has been discovered with regards to um, domestic abuse and any form of abuse is that there are small instances when when someone yeah. is growing up that actually contributes to to where someone is because no one gets in a relationship and just starts being beaten up. No one, you know, no one yeah. goes and and it's always this because the abuser starts with your mind. They start mm -hmm. breaking you down mentally. And yeah. if there are gaps within the mind, like, which is if you don't love yourself, which is if you don't feel like you're worthy, things like those are the loopholes that they use to start inflicting mental yeah. abuse. And it starts like with something silly, like, oh, are you going to wear that? Yes. they plant the Are you going to eat that? Yeah. So it, they wouldn't straight away say to you, well, you, you don't look nice in that because they have to test the grounds. They have to see what they can get away with and they work you that way. And I think teachers are very important. And that's why we're saying, you know, for that's one of the reasons why we're doing this campaign because women think, oh, I've got nothing to give. But it's so not true. Every single woman is in a position to make a huge difference to, a, a huge difference to other women like yeah. that teacher an impact in your life and it's someone who is still your friend yeah. till today and and it just helps us to see that your your voice is important everyone is important every female i don't i don't care what anyone says every female is important every woman every girl every child is important because they all bring something the teacher brought something to your life and and who knows what this broadcast will do to someone else so please share this share this right um so i'm gonna go into more about um your marriage yeah. um and one of the things I want to find out is like within your marriage, how did it get to that point where you went through the domestic abuse and how come you stay, you stayed for so long? Um, I know some people stay all their life, but then 10 years feels like a really long time anyway to be in such a position. Um, so if yeah. you can take us through that and help us understand what was going on yeah. in your mind, what was going on in your life at that time for us to be able to better understand and help women who are going through something like that. Okay. So basically, I had a very abusive childhood as well. So I was always put down. I was emotionally and mentally abused as a child from very young age, from my earliest memories. I was the the ugly child, I was worthless, no man's gonna ever take me. So I that was me. I had like mental abuse, I had emotional abuse from my parents. Then a lot of things happened in between that time. I actually ran away from home to get away from them when I was 16. I met my yes. partner when I was 17. He was 18. But even though he was 18, I didn't know them, he was a narcissist. So you can imagine how extremely intelligent and clever he is. He saw the vulnerability in me yeah. because I was very vulnerable that time. Um, I had a very close upbringing. I didn't have no communication with society. I was isolated as a child. So suddenly I'm in this big white world. Um, I met him straight away. He saw the vulnerability in me and he took me under his wings. And he, within first two weeks, he was like the knight in shining armor. 
he said all the right things he was extremely charming he took all the information from me that about my past about how i was brought up um and he kept that in in the bag after two weeks i met after two weeks of meeting him he physically attacked me from that attack i stayed with him for 25 years from from that attack i went in shock not only the shock but i also closed in because i already had abuse for me i felt it was normal i felt something good's going to come out of him we're going to work this out um i sort of went in a trap and then the the fear kicked in and then he started using all the information he took from me about my past to use it against me mentally and emotionally. In the beginning, it was small, small things that he did. For about 10 years, it was like little, little things. I was still able to work and um, I still had some freedom. But after that 10 years, the last 15 years was extreme. That's when he completely took control of me. I was isolated from society. Slowly, slowly, he would say, I don't like this person. I'm not happy with this, he'll plant seeds, I would get rid of that person. By the time I got rid of everybody, there was nobody left in my life. And it wasn't just words he said, I don't like this person. It would be with fear, with aggression, with shouting, um, showing me how he's going to do things to me, how he's going to beat me up, how this is happening. And he was a big guy. And because when they hit you first, you go into this fear, you go into this hole. And he was continually doing this to me and i was like this i was like going in me i started becoming ill a lot i was emotionally ill i was mentally ill i was drained i was shattered by then i isolated everybody from my family from society i didn't have anybody left so there was only four people left that was my two kids me and him he took complete control of me uh the worst thing that he did to me completely took my confidence away he made me feel so worthless and i thought i was there was nothing left of me was when he sexually abused me now when we say sexually abuse we don't just mean rape between two partners he would degrade me he would say to me i can't have sex with you because your private parts look black they look ugly they look disgusting so and so looks like this but when you're in fear with somebody and you're being abused mentally, emotionally, physically, you can't have sex with that person because you're scared. I would break out in sweats. I would panic. I couldn't open my legs. Um, so a lot of these things happened and he made me feel so worthless. By then, I completely lost myself. I lost my inner voice. I lost my confidence. I felt so belittled. I felt so worthless that... Um, Oh, he would also record me saying that he can't look at my face because if he looks at my face, uh, it puts him off. But he actually had his own problem, but he was blaming me. But I know that now, but I didn't know that then. So the abuse took so long and I put up with it for so long and I was so deep in this black hole. I couldn't see nor escape because the fear I had over him was bigger than anything in this world, bigger than God, bigger than my kids, bigger than my health, bigger than having friends and family. I, my desperation to make this work, to ha make him happy, um, it, was, it was bad. So I went in this deep hole and I couldn't come out, I couldn't see myself come out. I planned to commit suicide many times, I couldn't do it because I kept thinking who's gonna look after my daughter who's going to be the oh he's going to do something to my daughter so it's it just carried on and on and it went up to 20 years before i met these three amazing ladies and they just spoke to me they didn't say nothing to me it was in a karate club and it was a lady called erica she was the boss lady and she said to me one day resna you sit down next to me and i said no i can't sit next to you. i have to go and sit with my husband he's going to wait he's waiting for me and she said, what do you mean he's waiting for you? Why can't you sit down? And, and I thought, that's true. Why can't I sit down? All these ladies are sitting down and having fun and laughing. Why can't I sit down? And then she started digging, digging in me. She would not let go of me. And then I started having my wake-up call. But once I had that wake-up call, oh, my God, I had to learn 
what domestic abuse is. I had to educate myself um, what's right and wrong, what's in a marriage, what is a good relationship, what two people who love each other behave like. So it was a big, big task for me. Uh, by then, when you're abused for a long time, your brain shuts down. By then, I was mentally drained. Um, I couldn't even remember sentences. I was slurpy. I, I would talk and everything would be upside down. And he would say to me, see, you're getting old. Uh, you're, you can't talk. Nobody's going to put up with you. You're lucky you have me. I put up with you. I love you. I adore you. But he didn't because every hour, every minute, at the end, it got so extreme. He would emotionally, physically, mentally abuse me, put me down day and night in front of my children. It was so dramatic at the end that um, I did. I ran out the house a few times screaming, but as soon as he found me, I came running like a dog. He had so much power with me. As soon as I heard his voice, I'm out. So it, it is very, very hard. To leave a toxic relationship is one of the hardest things you will do. It's like an addiction. But once you find the courage and the strength, anybody can do it. Because if I can do it after 25 years, anybody can do it. I mean, um, thank you so much for especially sharing those difficult bits about your, um, your relationship. Because they're very intimate as well but it's also part of being able to um, overcome and yeah. being able to um, really help other people because once you're out, you can identify that in someone else yes. and your, your story frees other people because not many people would be able to talk about that, not publicly. Yeah. Um, not many people will even be able to tell that to their friends or even no. their families their confidence because there's something um, that women struggle with and that's shame. And one of the reasons why we're doing this is to break that bond of shame. Yeah. Because once you allow shame to be part of your life, then so many things that um, other people can help you with or other people can be able to refer you to someone who can help and you can you know, live yeah. a better life, a healthier life. If, if you're plagued by shame, then it's virtually impossible to come out of situations. And I think that's one of the reasons that people stay in there yes. for so long. You know, it's, it's hard to admit that a strong woman like myself can be in such yes. a position because we love to have this, um, we, ha we love to have this, um, you know, persona or personality, which is, oh, I can do anything. Yeah. Women are meant to be strong. We can take the world. We want everyone to think that everything is perfect, but it really isn't. No. And it's okay. Yeah. It's not perfect. Okay, it's not perfect. We're not going to be ashamed about it. We're going to address it head on and we're going to change our lives in the process. And, and I think that's one of the most important messages that I want people to be able to take from this that don't allow shame to no. have you stuck in a place because if you allow shame to do that then you're finished you're you're basically handing over your life to yes. someone else to destroy and you're responsible for your life mm. um so we've got chamika hall hall sorry i pronounced your name wrong i am so sorry sis um her question is how long did it take for you to to stay out of that how long did it take you um to get out of the marriage Five, it, it took me, once I realised what was happening, it took me five years. Because so basically, I, um, you are with, let, let's just go back. You are yes. with this person longer than the time years. you were married. So I think it's important yes. to actually say that. So you are with this person for 25 years. Yes. And um, from the time you spoke to the lady to the time that you left, how long did it take you? It took me five years because first I discovered he was a narcissist and that was a big shock to me because narcissists don't have empathy. They're completely empty. It's a personality disorder, yeah. so you can't fix them. 
So I realized I spent a life and I had two kids. I built a home and I kept looking at this man for something good to come out. And it never was going to come out because he's a narcissist. They are completely different people. Then I had to learn because I was always told by him that I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I've got no brain. My nickname was Donkey. He used to say, you're ugly, you're like a transvestite, you, you're just disgusting. How am I going to win a narcissist? Especially, they are highly intelligent, extremely manipulative. Even the psychiatrists don't win with them. Yeah. You have to cut them off. How me, that stupid person, going to win this person? So it took me five years. The reason it took me five years is because I had to learn about narcissists. Every day I was looking on YouTube and I was deleting the pictures because I didn't want him to see what I was studying. I would go to the toilet. I would light a candle and I would pray to God. And I would say, God, I can't deal with this man. I can't win with this man. You need to help me. And I would study everything. I would study how to leave controlling relationship, how to plan. And to build the strength up within me, it took all them years because it was really, really hard. Because when you're shattered and for you to lift yourself back up again, it is really hard, but you can do it. Because once you have the wake up call, a woman, she's on fire. And you need to grab yes. that fire and work with that fire. And when you, and then what I used to do, I used to talk to everybody then in secret because he was always with me. I couldn't even have a conversation. So I would go to the school quickly and I would walk fast. I can have five minutes extra in the playground with the ladies. And I would talk about things and they would say things. And if you realize when you're talking to somebody, in that 20 minutes, somebody will say something that's important. So when you said that all women are very important, yeah. honest to God, every single woman is the most important person because they always say something that you will relate to them. Or they will say something that exactly. will make sense, whether it's for cooking, or exercise, whether it's in a relationship or something naughty, they will say something that you will make a connection. And I would go to the playground because that's where I used to get all my information. And I would quickly talk, 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 and I would run back because I had to be home by 9.15. Otherwise, he would get angry. He would shout at me. Wow. He would get upset. I was on eggshells. I didn't want to upset him. I wanted to do everything very good. So I, that's why it took me further five years because I had to train myself. I had to learn. I had to gain knowledge. I had to educate myself. I had to be Resna. And that's yeah. why it took me five years. It is a long time, but I was a very weak person. I wasn't strong. I wasn't like my sisters. I wasn't like feisty. I was very fragile. I was completely gone. My spirit was dead. My soul was dead. My character, my belief, everything was gone. If he said to me, you're a cow, I would say, yes, I'm a cow. But now, wow. if he said to me, I'm a cow, I would say to him, excuse me, you're the devil. So um, one of the things I think that you've actually said that is so important is what you did as you were preparing to leave. Yeah. Because you acknowledged that you were not strong enough to leave just no. like that. So you decided to strengthen yourself. Yeah. And I think that's amazing because one of the ways we come out of any situation is by self-awareness yeah. and self self of observation and find out why why are we doing what we're doing and how can we do better and it's amazing that you were able to do that and i know you're saying that you were not strong but i think that you were strong to acknowledge that this is what i need to do and you did it yeah it took you five years because you were with this man for 25 years. Yes. You don't just come out of 25 years just like that. It doesn't happen. I no. mean, no one even leaves a job after 25 years, a well-paying job after 25 years. It takes them time to get to that position unless yeah. they're fired, right? Yeah. So, and this is, this is the place you have benefits, right? You don't want to leave. You find it hard to, to leave because we also need to acknowledge that you did have an attachment to him. 
Yes, I did. I was addicted. You didn't love him. Honestly, exactly. God, I, and I feel I was addicted to him because I feel that even now, when I speak to people, it's only been three and a half years. I find that I, I like talking to toxic men. I feel like I'm going to help them, but I can't help them. They have to help yeah. themselves. You yes. know, so I felt even when I left him, he would yes. call me. I would come running. Even when I the the, the the final call when I left him, the four days, I was completely numb. I was like detoxing. I was like, where is he? I, I, I need the shouting. I need the control. What am I going to do? Am I allowed to leave the house? Am I allowed to make a phone call? Um, like, should I eat something? Because he was telling me what to do all day long. I didn't even know if I should make a phone call or not. Yeah. Yeah. So um, at this point, I'm just going to ask anyone if they have any questions for Resna before um, I ask the next question, which might be us starting to wrap up. Um, I know she said so much and I know she's shared so much as well. But if you have any question to ask her, um, please type it in there and I'm going to bring it on the screen so she'll be able to see it as well. And she'll be able to answer. And, and also, I'm going to put her information at the bottom. So you will be able to reach out to her and have a conversation with her and kind of like find ways that if you're helping other women who've gone through something like that or something similar, uh, she can come and speak to your women because it's one of the things that she does as well. She shares her story and kind of like how she got out because what we see is um, she went to build up herself. I mean, I know there's some women who have left and then that's when they started the process of healing. That's when they started the process of seeing a therapist, seeing a counselor and, and processing what they went through. So people deal with it very differently. And our job here today is to let you know that you're not alone. Our job here today is to, to let you know that together we are strong. When we're united, amazing things happen and we can move mountains and also Know that you do not need to be ashamed because no. many people are many people have come up with it, right? So it's not the end of the world. Oh, many no. and many people will come out of it. Here in the UK, the statistics are one in four women have been in an abusive relationship. So that makes you think walking down the street, how many women yeah. and then that's like one in four women. So that's a huge number. And the World Health Organization has actually said that the numbers have gone up by 35%. So when we think about that, it's not just one in four anymore. It's one in probably three or one in two. So this is a huge, huge issue. I know people say, well, domestic violence, yeah, people are talking about it. It's a huge issue because many women are affected yeah. by it right and not everyone has that mindset of this is a toxic relationship and i need to go and allowing it to continue in home so now i've got a question from mirel and mirel is another amazing woman as well um i really love her i love her work um the question is how is all this abuse impacted your children because that's also important to know um uh, when i left him my son was 17 and my daughter was just coming on to 12. My son did go through a really, really difficult time because he started, we saw signs that he was behaving like his dad. And he wow. got upset that he didn't want to behave like that because when I used to go out, he used to call me 20 times, where are you, what are you doing, who are you talking with? So we sat down and we said, this is not normal. You can't behave like this. I'm the mother, I gave birth to you. I should be asking you where you are, not you asking me. He yeah. went on a healing journey. He started, he went to counselling. My daughter had emotional therapy because she thought I was going to die because of the spiritual abuse that he did in my house. She thought the spirits were going to take me away and she's going to come home and there's going to be no mother. I spoke to the school and the school was absolutely amazing and we worked together and she did lot of emotional therapy with the school my son after two years made a major recovery 
Um, he started doing his own healing, exercising, eating healthy, hanging out with positive people. He did have to, he did stop talking to his dad for three months in order for him to get his brain together and his understanding together. Because I said to him, that while you're talking to him, you're not going to discover who you are because he's going to manipulate you because he's an extreme manipulative man. So he stopped talking to his dad for three months and he went on a healing journey and he has recovered amazingly. He's a true gentleman now. And even yeah. us as a family, although it's only been three and a half years, we have achieved so much in the last one year. We have healed together as a family. When we do something in the house, we change things in the house, we talk together. There's no aggression. We like discuss, is this good? Do you think this is good? We discuss everything. We don't get angry because we moved a piece of furniture. We don't show threatening behavior. We're not aggressive with each other. If somebody wants to go out, they're allowed to go out. Yeah. As long as we tell each other, look, I'm going out and we're fine. You know, but it did impact yeah. him. It did impact my daughter. It impacted him more because I think he saw it more and he's a guy. He used to lock himself in the room. Um, and he, he, he said, mom, what upset me is I couldn't do anything for you. So it's something he had to, but I guarantee you, and hand on my heart and God as my witness, it doesn't matter what you think as a mum or a dad, 100% it affects the kids. What we have in schools these days where children are bullying other children, but girls are body shaming other girls, not being positive, being negative, I'm sorry, it does come from the house. Because when you are showing your children how you behave and how two people are behaving with each other, that's what they learn. Because I come across young boys yeah. that are 14, 15, that are so possessive over girls. I'm thinking, how, how does he know how to behave like this? Then I start asking questions. How's your mom and dad? How does your mom and dad? And you always find the father is behaving the same with the mother. Wow. It, you have to that's, the I think that's very, that's very interesting because um, listening to you speak and looking at that question that Mirelle asked, um, it's made me um, think about how many times women would stay in that relationship because of the children. That's usually yeah. the excuse. That's wrong. But this shows us that it actually harms the children more because yeah. they see that and then that culture and, and that behavior also continues in their lives. Yeah. So um, once again, you're not alone. I don't know how, how much we can stress this. Like the women who are watching this live and commenting are amazing women. You don't have to reach out to us. You don't have to reach out to me or Resna. You can reach out to any of the women on there that you feel connected to because you have, you have to make that decision where it's your life. You have to put yourself first. I know people, especially women, feel like that's being selfish but you have to put yourself first because if you're not first you're not you're not capable of of looking after your family so we have another question from um from angela and the question is um she's saying thank you for sharing your story and what advice would you give to a young girl if she is being abused do you know what you uh when you are being abused, you need to make a connection because I had so much help. I used to go to my local police meeting. I have a massive family. My sisters are very, very strong, feisty women. All used to say to me, but it was me. I needed to make a connection with somebody. If a young lady is getting abused, she needs to talk to somebody who she feels comfortable, whether it's a teacher, a friend, a neighbor, whether it's me on the internet, because I have a lot of young girls who contact me on Instagram and they always say to me, how do I leave my relationship? You have to make a connection. Once yeah. you make a connection with somebody and you have that wake up call, you start doing your own research. You start doing your own self love and believe that this is wrong. You have to talk to somebody. If you think you can't speak to nobody and nobody can help you, you can dial the domestic violence helpline. And I'm telling you, these people are amazing. 
the the people that I help you that have been through the same thing I have, but they've had more counselling. They've been on training courses. They are absolutely amazing, and you can speak to the domestic violence people any time, night or day, and they will help you. They will support you. They will put you in touch with people. Never ever feel ashamed of your life, even if you're getting abuse. That's your life, yeah, and that life will make you the person that you become after. Please don't feel ashamed because a lot of people say to me, oh, you talk about this and you talk about that. I said, you know what, that's my life and it's giving me a voice. My pain is my voice. And if it helps one lady and she can connect with me and she can make her life better and she's not in the situation anymore, I'm happy. So she, please, she needs to talk to somebody and the thing is, once you break that shame and you talk to somebody, you feel so much better. And you think, why didn't I speak before? I think that's, um, that's one of the things with shame. We always imagine the worst scenario. We always imagine the worst case out there. And we what the mind does is it actually magnifies things yes. more than what actually the reality is. So, um, it's it's so good to also be aware of that that your mind is magnifying this and it's not yeah. as big and as bad as you think it is you can actually speak to someone about it um what can you say to that woman scared in the house isolated especially with this quarantine from everyone going through abuse what can you actually say to them you know what i i had this talk a couple of weeks ago and now because we don't have anybody to talk to and domestic violence has gone up very high. And there was, I think, about 14, 15 ladies that have been killed because obviously the abuser is frustrated. He's more angry. Paul was my escapism. The 15 minutes walk in the morning, 15 minutes walk, that gave me breathing space. That's all I looked forward to. That was my day out. I used to get nicely dressed just to go to the playground. Now, that's been taken away from the ladies who want to escape. And they can't speak to friends and family. Yeah. You know, I know the police don't get enough credit, but I had amazing experience with the police when, when I left my abuser. You can dial 999. You can dial domestic violence unit. Okay, police, you might not want to get involved straight because you're in fear. They're going to come. They're going to arrest the guy. And you're going to think, oh, oh, what I've done, you're going to feel guilty because you're already feeling so much guilt. You're already being abused so much that you don't want to bring that guilt and that's fine on the domestic violence helpline. They will talk you through. They will give you peace. They will give you some comfort that there is help out there. Once you put that in your brain, because your mindset is completely gone, you need to change your thinking. Once that information goes yeah. in your brain, you start thinking and you think, you know what, I might be able to get help. Maybe I can do it one day. You need that little information. You need, just the way abuser plants the seed in you to abuse you, you need to start planting seeds in your brain. And that's what I used to do. I used to watch the videos and I used to be, you know what? Maybe I can do this. Maybe this is what's happening in my life. I am going to do this. And I used to pray so much that I am going to do it one day. And I did do it, but it took me five years. Don't st And I regret that I took so long because I'm 46. If I did it 10 years ago, I, I could have done so much stuff in my life. But I mean, I I'm glad I still done it, but I wish... I wish I did do it before. Please dial the domestic violence helpline. If you're if you're very, very in fear, just dial 999. Because sometimes calling the police could even put fear in the abuser. Yes. That's that's an idea. Yeah. <laughs> that's an idea. Yeah. So um we're going to be wrapping up now and I'm going to show Resna's book again. Now this book is free on kindle you can get yes. it it's an easy read you can read it in a few hours with a cup of coffee instead of watching your favorite show i'm telling you you can you know it, and and it's so it, it's so worth it because one of the things that we do that we waste time is watch stuff that do not um you know do not add value in our lives. And I think this adds value in lives because even though you're not going through abuse, 
you will learn things in here that you can help other people because we tend to feel like, oh, I'm not qualified to deal with this or I can't help. You know, we've we've come to that point where we're like, you know, I, I can't do anything. And I don't think that's true because we know someone who can help someone else. You know someone who can do something about it, you know? So yeah. we are all, we, we all collectively, we can do so much, right? So have have a look at that book download it you know read it pass it on to your girlfriends pass it on to people as a gift because it's free why not right and if you want to get a hold of resna i'm going to put her information there as well so i'm going to allow resna to um wrap up um with any last thing that she wants to say to us i know she said a lot yeah. but um before before we yeah. let her <laughs> let her wrap up I Okay, I just want to say um, the, a very important thing. You know, sometimes we come across friends and family and we know there's something not right in that relationship, but they're in fear. They feel agitated. They're like feeling anxious, anxiety. They don't want to say nothing to you. And you start talking to them and you do realize there's something going on in that relationship. All I want to say is please don't give up on that person. I know it's frustrating. I know you get angry. I know it's uncomfortable to watch a loved one going through um, a toxic relationship. But please don't give up because by you standing by them and supporting them, they might have the wake up call and they might come to you. Because I have a massive family and they all did get angry and they all got frustrated because mine was 25 years. But I had one sister and she never gave up on me. Every couple of weeks she would phone me in secret and I would delete the message and she would say, how are you? We're still here. How are the kids? We're thinking of you. Are you okay? And I would quickly read the message and I would delete it because I didn't want my partner to find the message. If he did, I'm in big trouble. So my sister never gave up on me. And so if you know somebody, it is frustrating. Everybody gave up on me because they thought we can't help her. Just like a drug addict or alcoholic, you get fed up, you get frustrated, you think we can't help him, dump him, gone. But this sister never gave up on me. So if you do know somebody, please support them, stay calm and relax and don't get too angry. It is very, very difficult when you're in these extreme toxic relationships, especially when you've been controlled so much you can't even think for yourself. They're thinking for you. They're telling you what to do, what to eat, how to behave. They're with you 24 hours a day that you can't even plan to think. You can't even plan something. Just support them, be with them and love them and show them support and courage. And by you doing that and talking, one day they might leave the relationship and thank you. Thank you so much, Resna, for um, making time and and just being open and sharing your story because um, you. there's some bits there which are very, very personal. And I want to thank you for using this platform to reach out to people and for being strong enough yeah. and thank brave you enough. So much. Thank to, you for um, having me. To do this it's it's just been so amazing to have you so guys um this is resna and she is one phenomenal strong woman um and one of the reasons why we're doing overcoming abuse and the whole facebook live series is because it's part of our bigger campaign which is the one voice campaign which is a global campaign we are having stories coming in that will be featured on the page that will be on our website that will be on our newsletters so we're asking women to join us in one voice you know your voice another woman's voice different perspectives creates a bigger picture and and stronger change and by being united we can do a lot so we're doing this one one voice campaign and we're asking people to take a selfie which is so easy take a selfie with one voice hashtag one voice hashtag her story matters and share it with the world so you can tag her story matters on it you can tag me on it and um you can also tell us what empowers you and why does your voice matter and tell us about female empowerment and what we're doing with this is like i said we're going to be showing it on online and one of the things that would really help others is to see that different women you know having different ideas different you know different concepts every 
single person has their own take on on female empowerment they have their own take on what empower women are so diverse and none of not no two of us are the same and i think that's the beauty of it right um and we want to showcase that to the world because i think the more united we are we can make great changes and with this covid as well right now it's affecting more women uh, there's been a rise globally of domestic abuse and rape against women that's like 35% increase and that's a huge number which means there's some women who have never gone through this that will go will have gone through this in this time that's a huge number 35% is a huge huge figure and that could be your sister and she would not say anything it could be your cousin it could be your mom it could be your aunt it could even be you right so if you would like to share your story please do send us an email at stories at herstorymatters.com um you can send me a message i'm really friendly you can send us a message on her story matters you can reach out to resna you can reach out to the amazing women who've commented there because they are phenomenal and you can speak to them and you can share stuff and everything else so i look forward to you sharing this video please 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 share it share this message ask your friends to take a selfie with one voice and her story matters on it ask them to share it and tag us and write what empowers them and if they are in a position to tell their story ask them to contact us and we'll share their story so uh, I I just want to thank you all for tuning in thank you all for putting up with us for an hour that's you know an hour of your time thank you so much for your lovely comments and um for keeping us company for this hour and um I do wish you a lovely day and stay safe keep safe and remain healthy not just body wise but also mentally because it matters right Thank take care now have a lovely day bye oh